All right. Hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Sarah Saucedo, and I recently served as the Regional Fellow for the Tornadoes Region, and I will be hosting this session today. I want to start just by giving an acknowledgement that I am calling in on what is traditionally the Osage Nation land. And so I recognize and honor these ancestral grounds, and I'd encourage you all to find out what land you sit on as well. And so uh, today I'm joined by two amazing students. We have Alexander Posner, the president of Students for Carbon Dividends, and Alexandria Viesnor, the co-founder of Earth Uprising. So we're just going to jump right in, and we're going to start with Alexander. If you can please describe the mission of your organization and the work you do. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and back with so many good friends um, at CCL. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, uh, my name is Alexander Posner, and I lead an organization called Students for Carbon Dividends, uh, S4CD. Uh, we work on college campuses to mobilize youth leaders across the political spectrum uh, and with the goal of emboldening uh, bipartisan leadership on climate change and in particular uh, around the carbon dividend solution. Uh, we were co-founded in 2018 by 100 plus student organizations from across the country. Uh, including uh, 50 plus right of center groups and 50 plus left of center groups. Uh, this was the first time at our launch that a chorus of college Republican groups had ever endorsed uh, a national climate solution, hadn't happened before, and it shows how far we've come in the last few years. Um, and by extension, the first time a bipartisan cohort uh, had ever uh, done the same. I'd say there are three sort of key principles that undergird the work we do. Um, first, uh, that to solve uh, climate change, uh, we must put a price on carbon. It's a cornerstone solution, hard to imagine how we can solve the problem without it. Uh, it's not the only thing we need to do, but a well-designed uh, carbon pricing plan would go, or uh, would deliver, uh, the or do the majority of the heavy lifting uh, on emissions reductions. And in particular, when paired with complementary policies, the expected, many of the expected complementary policies would help us go further faster uh, in meeting uh, core emissions targets. Um, with, a, with a framework like the carbon dividends approach, uh, we think it's a really politically attractive approach, the centerpiece uh, of what both of our organizations focus on. Uh, sen uh, second, bipartisanship uh, is, is, needs to be core to our climate strategy. It is core to our organization's approach, and not just as a nice thing to have, but as a need to have. Just to bring this into focus, uh, between now and 2050, uh, the U.S. will be governed by 15 different Congresses and uh, by at least four different presidents. So any hope of climate progress premised on the hope of sustained one party rule uh, is doomed to fail, right? We need climate strategies that can pass and last uh, solutions that are resilient uh, across the inevitable changes uh, in political leadership. So that's why bipartisanship is key. And third, to help deliver both of those things by uh, a a price on carbon, the carbon dividend solution, and bipartisanship needed to make it a reality. Uh, student leadership uh, has a major role to play. We heard that this morning uh, with both of the uh, uh, kickoff speakers, and we work on a bipartisan basis to make sure both young Republicans, young Democrats, everywhere in between uh, are at the center of the conversation. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Alexandria. I'm really excited to be joining you all here. Uh, just a little introduction for myself. I'm a 16 year old climate activist and the founder of Earth Uprising. And I got involved in climate activism after I saw the effects of climate change in my hometown community. And so it was the campfire in Paradise, California. And that was at the time one of the worst wildfires in California's history. Since then, we've seen the first ever gigafire though. And I'm actually right now gearing up for uh, what could possibly be another fire season that's happening. And so um, that's how I got involved. And um, from there, after I saw the effects of climate change, though, I started striking. And after I started striking on December 14th of 2018 in front of the United Nations headquarters, I ended up striking every single Friday after that for almost over a year, all the way up until the pandemic. 
And so from the climate strikes, one thing I noticed was that there was still not enough young people in the movement and we still need to bring more people into the climate movement. And so I went on to found Earth Uprising and Earth Uprising really does focus on that. It focuses on climate education, uh, mainly a focus on peer to peer education. So young people teaching each other about the climate crisis, because that's how we saw the school strikes go much further. It was a is it was another young person talking to another young person. So going on that same method of just teenagers talking to each other about climate change. And so uh, we really focus on that part of education. And I'm really excited to see what this movement is going to look like as well, now that we're kind of going into this after COVID world. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Awesome, thank you both so much for all the work that y'all have already started doing in your communities and nationally. Um, and so moving on, uh, starting with Alexandria, as a student, why is climate action important to you and how does that interplay into your organization's support for carbon pricing? Yeah, so one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about climate change and I think that everyone should be, especially as a young person, is because the climate crisis is going to affect every part of my life and other young people's life. It's going to affect where we live in the future, what kind of job we have. It's going to affect, you know, what schools we end up going to. And a lot of young people are even having conversations about whether or not they even want to have children in the future because they don't want to bring people into this climate change world that we'll have. And so because my generation's life cycle is going to be so affected by this. It's so important that we have everybody involved and um, doing something to help and mitigate the climate crisis. And so one thing the Earth Uprising really does talk about a lot is the solutions of um, the climate crisis. And so a lot of the times when we would go on school strikes, we'd be saying climate action now, but people would be like, well, what exactly do you want? And so we've started showing up with the solutions. And in one way that we're showing other people what solutions there are, one of our main campaigns that Earth Uprising is doing is um, focusing on creating a uh, climate change curriculum um, where we not only talk about the basic science of the climate crisis, like the greenhouse effect, but going much further into climate justice and green careers and, um, you know, uh, literacy to the climate movement, and so kind of a climate education 2.0. And so in that, we talk about the solutions. And one of those solutions is, of course, um, putting a price on pollution, and a carbon tax would do that, and carbon pricing, of course. And so we're educating young people on these type of things. So I, I would say what motivates me as a, as a student, I um, uh, majored in the past. I was a history major um, and often thought about the fact that we could have been born uh, at any moment in history, right? Uh, could have been born in ancient Rome, in ancient Greece, American Revolution, the Gilded Age. We could have been born in the future, 2100, 2150, beyond. Uh, but we weren't. Uh, we were born at this moment where the knowledge of the climate threat and the window to act on it is upon us, right? In the grand scheme of history, our lifespans are pretty short. And we're at uh, really the scene of the crime, so to speak, right? The moment of significance. What happens on our watch during our lifetimes will uh, likely reverberate across, across the centuries uh, and affect the course of human history forever. Uh, pretty awesome responsibility, uh, but why, it's precisely why it's incumbent on us to rise uh, to meet the moment. Uh, in particular, as a young person uh, with decades of life ahead, uh, uh, like Alexandria, uh, this is also just a question of raw self-interest, right? This is uh, going to affect the lives we the lives we lead, the opportunities we have, the economy uh, we get to grow up and live in. Uh, so I often say, you know, somewhat provocatively, I mean, this is not about sacrificing on behalf of some obscure species of frog that you'll never meet. I mean, sure, that's part of the story. This is just self-interest, right? Uh, this is in our raw self-interest um, and, and ultimately all of our self-interest to lead on this issue uh, and deliver real solutions. Thank you. Okay, so um, I know Alexandra, you already talked about this a little bit, but um, what is your organization doing to advocate for and educate on carbon pricing? And we can start with Alexander. Sure. Um, so we work on college campuses. That's our uh, primary sandbox, uh, and in particular, focus on student leaders. Uh, so an example of this most recently, uh, this past year, 
uh, helped to organize something we call the Student Government Leader Statement on Carbon Dividends. Uh, it was a statement of college student body presidents, the senior most elected uh, youth leaders on any campus uh, that was modeled and inspired off of the Economist Statement on Carbon Dividends. Uh, and uh, we were able to pull together a real uh, show of force from youth leaders across the country. Over 400 student body presidents uh, have signed on from all 50 states representing campuses with more than 4 million students. Uh, and included within this, uh, the bipartisan support that we know is there and we know is so uh, valuable to uh, any inevitable climate breakthrough. So campuses more associated with the right, BYU, Hillsdale, Liberty, uh, Liberty University, all the way over to Berkeley, Yale, University of Michigan, et cetera. So uh, where our elected leaders have been unwilling or unable to come together to find uh, common ground, uh, we on college campuses are showing them how it's done. Uh, we are now working to uh, embolden uh, and amplify the voices of a lot of these leaders, uh, make sure they're in meetings with elected lawmakers, educating them on the merits of the carbon dividend solution, and highlighting uh, the strong youth support uh, across the political spectrum. Yeah, so I did already touch upon this a little bit as what Earth Uprising is doing, focusing on education and mainly also focusing on teaching young people about the solutions, mainly because a lot of people my age and students and youth often really don't understand carbon pricing, especially if they're not fully in the climate movement yet. And the way it works and how it dividends and rebates are created can sometimes be complicated. And so we work to break down how carbon pricing policy works and how it can benefit different communities. But then also Earth Uprising, we have uh, city coordinators across the country, but we also have people all around the world in over 20 countries. And so one thing that we really focus on is a global perspective. And so I've been reading a lot about Canada's carbon pricing system, and I think it's important to look at carbon taxing from more of a global perspective and to be in solidarity with other countries. And that would really make putting a price on pollution much more successful. And so that's what we focus on is building that network of young people who, when there is um, policy that we need to be pushing for around these uh, different solutions, that we have a system that we can easily activate for young people to go and push for these things. So it's a chain reaction. We focus on education so that we can empower young people to go out and take action. So once they know what we need to do, what solutions we need to have, then they can go out and activate in their own community and go out and protest and lobby and push for that change because they themselves understand what's happening and then they can go out and push for it. That's awesome. I know I'll be looking forward to having that uh, come out and find that hopefully on your Instagram or website perhaps. Um, so next, uh, we'll start with Alexandria. What can grassroots organizations like CCL do to build relationships with student-led groups like yours? Well, I, of course, think partnerships and community is so important, especially because that's the only way our movement will grow is if we work together. And so I say all the time that the climate movement is basically like this vast ecosystem of climate organizations because there's so many people who work in different areas of it. And so there's people who work in you know, uh, protesting people who work in policy, those who work in education, and they're all really important. I think that every um, person's theory of change is important when all of them are working together. And so um, one ways that people can work together is just um, partnering together on campaigns or if there's an action that's going on or protests. So there's so many ways to partner in that way, specifically when it comes to the youth partnering with the youth movement, um, because there's so much that people can learn from each other and solidarity makes the movement so much stronger. So partnerships in the way of just giving advice, having conversations, um, connecting with people and, um, you know, donating, of course, the youth movement um, pays a lot out of pocket. And we're just a bunch of youth who use GoFundMe sometimes. And so donations, of course, are always um, important. And so there's so many ways to partner. And I think that working together with other people and other organizations is what makes our movement as strong as it can be. Well, I think that's a great answer from Alexandria and associate myself with what she said. Uh, in addition, I, I just a few things to add 
Uh, one, CCL is lucky under its own hood um, to have CCL higher ed, uh, led by the very talented Clara Fang, as well as CCL youth. Um, so already many young advocates uh, under, under the CCL umbrella uh, that I encourage you to reach out to and partner with. Um, two, uh, in terms of partnership, you know, there are often individual students or chapters or what have you in different uh, locations, um, you know, find out if those, those exist. Uh, sometimes it's more effective to go to national leadership, reach out and see where there are opportunities to collaborate. The other thing too uh, is, you know, at the end of the day, we, there are lots of people here at this event, uh, lots of people who are involved uh, in climate advocacy generally, but the vast majority of folks on a day-to-day -day basis are not. Um, so I think there's, I think we should always challenge ourselves to continue growing the pie. And sometimes instead of just, you know, playing hot potato with advocates that are already in the climate uh, world, uh, I think our movement uh, would be better served and strengthened by continuing to bring new people into the equation. Um, so uh, yeah, so many young people who want to be involved, we constantly find and are just looking for an on-ramp. And uh, where you can provide that, I think that's the most uh, successful approach. Very well said. And this kind of leads up to our very last question. And we'll start with Alexander. Uh, what advice would you give other young activists and adults who want to get more involved and be allies to groups like yours? Yes. Well, first thing I'd say, do it. Get involved. Uh, we need all talented hands on deck uh, and enormous opportunity to make a big difference. I'm always reminded of that line, uh, I think from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, and I think we've uh, found that to be the case in our experience. Uh, all of our orgs, I think, represent that spirit and idea. Um, so, uh, you know, lean in, take the dive, join an existing group, uh, many opportunities to uh, partner and engage. Uh, if you spot an opportunity to found something new that would be additive, go for it as well. Uh, the real, uh, you know, we need entrepreneurship in the business community. We need it in the, uh, in the advocacy space as well. So uh, entrepreneurship, always welcome. Uh, and then in terms of specifically of how, uh, how to collaborate with uh, youth advocates, uh, you know, we, this is as a bipartisan uh, movement, uh, we don't have a one-size-fits-all message, right? Uh, tailored messages uh, delivered by trusted messengers. Uh, so as we often say uh, in our org, this is uh, many journeys through the desert to the same promised land. Uh, and that includes not only messages, perhaps somewhat different left and right, but also sometimes uh, differences uh, in how we communicate across generations. So uh, empowering uh, youth within your own chapters or within your own org to be the tip of the spear uh, would be my advice. Um, and uh, sometimes if it, let's say you're uh, not in the student uh, age bracket, uh, giving, uh, being more of a behind the scenes hero where appropriate um, and allowing students to lead the charge uh, in communicating with peers. There we go. Um, yes, I agree with everything um, that you just said. And kind of just to add on a little bit to that, I think that one of the main things that I say when people say they want to get invo involved in the climate movement is um, to first find your climate story. So how are you being affected by the climate crisis? Because right now we're seeing the effects of climate change all around the world, but in different ways and everyone's being affected differently. And so find out how you're being affected because that can be a really big motivator for getting involved and wanting to take some sort of action. And so from there, find out what you wanna do about that. Do you want to take some sort of direct action, find a group or an organization, or of course, start your own um, that focuses on that area? Or if you wanna work in policy, find a group that focuses on advocating or writing policy. And so I think that once you find your climate story, that can really help in getting involved and finding out what you want to do because that passion and that motivation is really important when it comes to um, taking some sort of action. And so those are the main two things that I recommend. But then of course, once you get involved, then you find a community of people. And I think that that's one of the most important things is when you're working and you're organizing with other people, it makes this work so much more fun. And you do need fun in this because this is more of a 
marathon. It's not a sprint. And so finding a group of people and just a community is really important. Awesome. Very well said, both of you. Um, so now we're going to turn it over and look through some of the Q&As that our audience have submitted. And I'm just going to go through whatever has been upvoted the most by the audience members. So first up, we have a question from Remy in New York. Um, how do you get more young people into lobby median, meetings? I find at my college that lots of people are willing to strike, but not to have sit down conversations with their members of Congress. So either of you can answer or both of you. Well, I'd just say one thing on, on this on this point, you know, I think uh, it's probably, I mean, it's a good question. I think it's not an accident that most student organizing um, tends to be on on campus, right? I mean, We've, we've seen the proliferation uh, over the course of many years of sort of uh, activism along the lines of fossil fuel divestment, et cetera, which takes what is a national and international issue and creates a local campus mission, right? People like seeing things on their own turf in their own backyard because it's a project and mission they can wrap their hands around. Sometimes Congress can feel too distant. Um, and there's uh, there's convenience of rolling out of bed from your dorm, you know, into, into the activity and back again. So uh, main point, all, all, all that is to say, uh, make it easy um, for folks to, to lobby, sort of break it down. You know, sometimes it feels just presented in the abstract, feels too daunting. You know, we'll, here's the car to get you there. We'll make sure there, uh, you know, there's food or whatever. Uh, we'll find a time that doesn't conflict with class, et cetera. Um, if there's a clear illuminated pathway, and makes it easy, I think that's the best way to get advocates involved. Yeah, I think that when it comes to lobbying or talking to politicians, one of the first times that I ever did that, I was with a group of people, which made it much more comfortable just having a bunch of people there who have the same message as you, so you won't be persuaded any, any certain way. And so I think that the more that you lobby and the more that you lobby politicians, it becomes much more easier to, to do so and you kind of understand your message and how to stay focused on it. And so I think that just finding a group of people usually makes it much more comfortable. And um, and then once you start lobbying though and talking to politicians, it becomes um, much easier because you get to a certain point where you're just like, you know what you want and nothing's really holding you back from telling them what they need to do. So it does get easier the more that you do it. Awesome. And so the next question, um, it's coming from Brian. He is a sustainability director. He asks, I work with students on a college campus and find that nearly all are concerned about the climate crisis, but few take the step to get engaged in advocacy or activism. Any advice on motivating young people who care but aren't involved? So if you can give any advice of how to motivate us students, what would you say? Uh, I actually get this question quite a bit. And I was actually talking to someone I used to go to school to school with um, a couple years ago. And she was talking to me about my activism. She was just like, how do you get involved? Because it can seem kind of daunting. And really, I think that once you get over the first kind of mountain of getting into climate activism, it kind of becomes much easier. And so one of the first things that I think can be the easiest for a person to do is to just utilize social media because with our movement social media is probably one of the greatest tools that we have because it's how we meet other people it's how we connect and so i mean just following a climate organization online or just following um, an activist or someone uh, in the movement it kind of makes it easier because you see what's happening and you can kind of get involved that way or sending someone a message I think that that can be one of the easiest ways to kind of get over that hill of maybe intimidation to getting involved. And so um, it really become, it's really so easy once you start like messaging and trying to send emails. Um, I think that it's more intimidating than it can actually be to get involved. Ditto, I mean, I think that was very well said. Uh, yeah, our, our little line internally is make friends before you make arguments. Um, and, uh, you know, this people make the place, people make the experience, uh, you build a community and build friendship, everything else will follow. Okay, so the next question is coming from Karen. Uh, what is a good strategy for engaging campus administrators who are unwilling to discuss fossil fuel divestment? I think that one of the best ways is to just, um, is to honestly 
you know, join a group on campus who focuses on divestment. Um, like there was a couple uh, groups I remember who um, were trying to get their school to divest and they actually ended up like protesting in the middle of one of their football games and they just ended up causing a bunch of ruckus, but it, you know, got so much attention at what the school needs to be doing. And so I think that joining a group or of course protesting on campus is one of the best ways to get their attention and also put pressure on them um, to divest. And so I've seen a lot of groups start up who focused on divestment for their schools and they've done so much work in the time that they're they're doing that type of work. And so um, just finding, finding that group protesting, of course, and uh, don't stop your pressure on them. Okay, let's see. The next question is coming from, uh, let's see, Leslie, are students being able to engage their parents and grandparents to take climate action? If not, how can some of us elders help? Could you just say the first line of that? I, it, I just had a little bit of trouble hearing. Sorry. Yes. So it says, are students being able to engage their parents and grandparents to take climate action? If not, how can some of us elders help? Yeah, I mean, I think in our experience, the answer um, has been yes. You know, a lot of uh, having young people talk to uh, their parents or grandparents can be a very effective strategy. And, uh, you know, if we look, for example, at the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus right now in the House and the Senate, I know there was a, a, an interview uh, when the Senate caucus launched and, you know, hats off to CCL for all of your work in helping make both of those possible really crowning achievements. Uh, the, but in that interview, they went around and were, I think it was on CBS this morning talking to various senators and um, almost all of them cited kids or grandkids uh, as a primary motivator uh, in getting involved in the climate arena. So a definitely a very powerful lever uh, and uh, encourage, uh, yeah, encourage all to take advantage of it where, uh, where it's appropriate. Uh, I, yeah, I agree with all of that. And um, one thing, I actually saw a report that came out a uh, study that said that um, one of the main motivators of adults to care about climate change um, were actually teenage girls. <laughs> um, so teenage girls talking to their parents were one of the main things that made them start to pay attention to climate change. And um, I mean, that made a lot of sense to me because when I was, you know, when I was organizing a bunch before the pandemic, I remember there was a lot of young people who wanted to get involved and come to the meetings, come to the protests. And sometimes their parents wouldn't necessarily allow them to go. And so one morning there was this girl who came to one of the protests and I thought she wasn't gonna come because she wasn't allowed to, but she said that that same day she ended up um, talking to her mom about why this is so important to her and why this is so serious. And, um, and it ended up working and her mom ended up becoming really supportive in her uh, parents ended up becoming supportive of what she was doing. And so um, I think that, you know, young people are very persuasive in themselves. Um, of course, teenagers can be very stubborn. And so we kind of just have to use that sub stubbornness for good into getting parents involved and getting people to take some sort of action. And so there's so many ways, though, that um, Older generations can help too, of course, because I think that every pressure to everyone to care about this is important. Awesome. Thank you so much, both of you, for coming and joining us today on your Saturdays. Um, I know I've learned a lot from both of you. I hope all of our attendees have as well. And that's about all of the time we have for this session. So thank you again uh, so much. And for everybody else, the next thing we have on the schedule is the Action Team Fair. So thank you again so much. And I believe um, you can put your websites or Instagram handles in the chat if anybody would like to follow up um, on, you know, what Alexander and Alexandria are doing with their groups and see how you can be involved. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. 
Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.